Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 565th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Shea for the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have the fun CFO, Jen Bro, and I'm taking a risk here. I've got my door open. My daughter is on her iPad, no headset. My father-in-law is visiting. Can I get this done? You know, I have to get this done. It was supposed to be done a week ago, but I didn't do it. We were heading to vacation, and I just didn't do it, you know, had too much on the plate. But hey, better late than never. Um, Jen was a, a great guest, and we get into the money matters. And, uh, you know, sometimes things are overlooked. As entrepreneurs, maybe we tend to sweep some things under the rug that we shouldn't. We think we can make it up on sales. So, you know, let's just drop the cat in the punch bowl, shall we, and look at what it takes to keep more of what you earn. That's the name of the game. Earning is great. Keeping what you earn is fantastic. Um, but if you need help growing your sales, I hope you make more money so you can grow to the level you can afford Jen and have a need for her. So join us, sellmoreofeverything.com. Got a couple new members here lately, so that's a lot of fun, bringing folks in. Sellmoreofeverything.com, live calls every Monday, private group, on-demand content, invest in yourself. It's a crazy world. So invest in yourself, all right? So go do that and then come back and listen to this episode with Jen. Jen Bro, a virtual CFO, all the way from Florida. Welcome to the sales podcast. How the heck are you? I am doing awesome. Thank you so much, Wes, for having me. Hey, look, why do I need a CFO? I'm in sales. I just make money, right? Sales cures all ills. So I'll just go make more money, right? Oh, I love that question. And it takes me all the way back to my corporate accounting days when uh, the sales guys and I would go back and forth and uh, they'd be like, just say yes, I'm selling the product, just say yes. And I'm on the back end saying, okay, but X, Y, Z. Um, But anyways, flashback. So long story short, it's one thing to make a sale. It's another thing to be profitable. You know, you can make. No, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. That makes no sense. <laughs> it's like that old thing, like, you know, well, we're losing a dollar per sale. Well, we'll just make it up on volume. What? <laughs> right. It doesn't really work that way. I think there was a lesson missed in math somewhere along the way. But uh, yeah, you know, a CFO uh, at some point in your business, uh, usually about that million dollar mark is when you need to bring in a fractional CFO to take a look at your systems, your processes. Uh, your compliance, all that boring stuff that most salespeople don't care about. And most entrepreneurs, you know, are too busy, uh, you know, developing great products and uh, building their communities and selling to really think about that. But what I have found in my experience is clients come to me about that one to $3 million mark. And all of a sudden it's like breaks in their business and they don't know why. And when we start pulling things apart from a financial perspective, Um, we look at maybe some of the opportunities that were missed along the way in that journey to that first one to 3 million. Um, And we get things optimized, organized, automated, uh, making sure that those particular founders or executives have the information they need on the daily, weekly, monthly basis that they need it to make different decisions, smarter decisions, Decisions that uh, don't make you wish you, um, <laughs> you know, uh, regret a, a certain um, pivot in your business that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Yeah, because people like it or not, that employees are not going to usually care about the business the way you do. No, you know, my my first assistant, um, I had an office for about fourteen months in in all these years, and she was a great assistant. But like we, you know, we mail stuff, people buy a book, buy CDs, whatever. And she was just filling out the thing and mailing it. And then my wife, you know, who's like super analytical and super frugal, stretching my dollars to for seven kids. Right? So God, God bless her. Uh, yes. She's just curious and looks at it, uh, you know, brings in, you come to find out there's like a postal salesperson, you know, they came to the office and analyzed how we were mailing and, you know, our shipping, you know, for this was like 2014, like the price of a, just a book, right. Went from like almost $9 to like $3. 
doesn't sound like a big deal, but you know, apply that to everything we were shipping, I don't know, 50, 60 things uh, a month. Well, that adds up. But now, now imagine, you know, $3 million and you have 50 people that are doing something inefficiently, wasting $3 per thing they do and they each these those 50 people do that thing 10 times a day it's like holy smokes we're, we're losing a lot of money <laughs> absolutely absolutely a great example that i usually find stepping into a company who's at that one to three million mark that's about where people start with me um is their uh, dues and subscriptions their SaaS. And they have signed up for so much stuff that they're paying for either monthly or annually or quarterly. They have forgotten all about it. They're not using it anymore because such and such team members said they had to have it six months ago or two years ago. Nobody was really paying attention to it. Um, so it, that goes along the, the same lines of what you were speaking to, Wes, is you know there has to be uh, an organization and an automation of the data and somebody looking at it on a regular basis to say, okay, because if you can cut, you know, another 10 cents off of every dollar uh, that you're bringing in, that's a significant amount of profitability that is just being left on the table. So that is one of my geniuses. I go into companies and I see things right away. Uh, you know, if, if you look, if you happen to look at my website at gembro.com, you know, clients say she has saved us millions of dollars. She saved us tens of thousands of dollars in the first six months. I mean, there's always something, whether it's mm -hmm. you overpaid your taxes because you accidentally forgot to hook up one of your credit cards to your QuickBooks account because you wanted to do your QuickBooks by yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, you just missed out on all those expenses. So then your taxable income was wrong. You overpaid your taxes. Now we got to go through a whole thing with doing an amended return and begging the government back uh, for that money. So um, I love it when people step into my space and we start to work together because not only does it just pay for me and my team of what we do, but it really helps catapult them to that next level to be able to do the things that they really want to do in their in their company. But maybe they've been handcuffed because of cash flow, cash runway. Um, you know, profitability has stalled, et cetera. Yeah, I'm working with a company right now. They wanted to switch from Keep to HubSpot. Mm. So I helped them switch. We're getting up and running. Now I'm talking to their marketing guy. Well, their marketing guy likes click funnels. Yep. All right. Um, and, you know, Keep didn't have great landing pages. So, but Keep was $300 a month. HubSpot's $800 a month. Yeah. So, but he likes ClickFunnels. Well, now you need ClickFunnels to Zapier, Zapier to HubSpot to get the things coming in. Okay. I'm like, fellas, you don't, with HubSpot, you don't need ClickFunnels. Yeah. All right. You don't need ClickFunnels. Then you don't need Zapier. Now you probably still need Zapier because it does other things. But so now I'm like, there's three or $400 a month, you know, that can be saved just with that, that one application, not to mention a reduction in complexity, not to mention better reliability, because you don't have three systems talking to each other. Boom. The, the lead comes in, it's right in the system. Boom. Right. You know, assigned to the, to a sales rep. Um, but you need that third party coming in and looking at things because I asked the marketing guy, he's a great guy and generating a lot of leads. I'm like, why are you using ClickFunnels now? Well, I just kind of know it better. Mm -hmm. Like, Not a good enough excuse. <laughs> you know, right. it's like, we got to rebuild it. You know, I know it's going to suck for you, but it's best for the client. Because uh, right, I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight. They already bought the software from me. So I'm like, use it, don't use it. I still get paid, right? But I want them to do better. So... But yeah, I mean, it's a classic example. So yeah, um, they'll save yeah. three or four hundred dollars a month once this gets built, rebuilt. Absolutely, yeah. you can stay with the systems and processes and team members who are just putting band aids, you know, trying to keep this ship afloat, or you can, you know, roll up your sleeves and do the work that you know the multiple seven or eight figure entrepreneur has done. Uh, and lead with building better systems, processes, and containers uh, in order to actually support the vision, the mission that is just over the horizon. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so I, I was 
complaining like crazy on our Facebook page for our HOA because during COVID they shut our pool down. Yep. Right. And our board was all older people, no kids at home. Uh, and some of them had their own pools. Mm. So didn't hurt them to close the pool down. Right. Right. And I'm like, open the pool. So I was so vocal. Then people are like, well, you should run for the board. So three of us ran for the board and we, and we we're on. So there's three, three new people now. And I'm the president. I'm like, Oh man, what are y'all doing? Making me president. Uh, but one of the guys is super analytical. He's a, he's a fixer, right? So uh, he takes over companies and, and pours over the books. So as we start looking at things, like we just eliminated like $18,000 in annual fees to our property management company, mm-hmm. because one of the things we were paying $500 a month. So our property management company manages 85 properties. 83 of them are done online for the architectural review, right? So painting your house, whatever, you got to get approval. So two of the 85 are done in person because the the former head of the architectural review committee is an 80-year-old guy. He's been here from the beginning. He's been on the board for 16 years, you know, and he liked doing them in person. And I'm like, is that worth $6,000 to the community? for you to have your hand. Well, we tried it online. Yeah. You were 77 years old and you tried it for two months and you didn't like it. So you switched. I'm like, and now he's, now he's, his feelings are hurt and he quit. He resigned. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's like, it was a unanimous vote from the board. I'm like, it's not worth six to $7,000 a year for you. Mm-hmm. Like you're saying one person tried it, then they left and you're still paying for it. Cause you know, cause we asked the property management, why, why are you do this way? Cause they wanted it that way. And you're one of two out of 85. I'm like, okay, <laughs> got to switch. Right. So I, I can imagine you're having that conversation 10 times a day with your client. <laughs> I don't know. Throw that away, Absolutely. delete that, cancel that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it's one thing, these onesie twosies, you know, that do add up to a couple grand here and there a month, sometimes up to 10 grand a month is being just completely lost down the river. Um, you know, some of the other interesting things is, you know, hopping into tech development engagements too quickly without doing due diligence. So putting down massive retainers, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for somebody to build a custom metrics dashboard or uh, something of that nature. And because they, the, the particular CEOs and COOs that I work with, you know, finance isn't necessarily uh, their first language. And so they sign up for these big things and then realize that the finance infrastructure is nowhere near ready to be able to actually, you know, receive the benefits of that particular service. Um, And then it's months and months and months of scrambling and trying to figure out what to do. And so I, I come into those engagements and it's like, and you know, if they would have had me there as part of that, it would be um, yes, no, maybe let's do our due diligence. So I find there is so much waste in decisions that affect the finance um, part of the business. But because that's not a lot of people's first language in in the business who are making the daily decisions, um, it ends up really leaving a lot on the table that could have been used for you know, additional paid advertising or a new team member that was desperately needed. Um, So really having that round table wisdom from a finance chief executive perspective is so important during the scaling and growing process of any company. Look, you're just going to be a bean counter. You're a wet blanket. I need to take these clients golfing. Okay. And we need the good scotch. You're just going to tell me no. <laughs> you know, I'm actually not that CFO. And it's funny because, again, I'm having flashbacks to my corporate days, uh, you know, being in finance and working up the ladder and doing all this uh, in multi billion dollar companies. But uh, I would get that same thing. They're like, you're different. Like, you're not like you're the typical accounting finance person. And, 
which is true. You know, for me, I understand the journey that the entrepreneur goes on and all the stages at all the different revenue levels. Um, I know that what the pain points are and sometimes the question to that answer you just asked is a yes. And sometimes it's a no, if it's, if it's going to be a no, if it means that, um, we're not going to be able to pay your salary this month, which means your kids don't eat, then it's going to be a no to the golfing and the expensive, uh, you know, cocktail. But if we have cash flow and we have things in the pipeline, um, as far as, you know, launches or new affiliate programs or whatever, and we can see ahead that there's an ROI on that particular expense, even though it may not come into the pocket right away, then it's a heck yes. Go and have the golf and the good whiskey and wine and dine this particular uh, person. And uh, so it's really about me tuning into where exactly they're at in their company, having the live data for what is truly going on, understanding the forecast ahead. Uh, and making decisions, everyday decisions, like whether to go golf and get the whiskey or whether to hire a new team member, you know. What are some early things? So, you know, we keep hearing about the great resignation. We hear about the gig economy, the side hustle. Uh, as we're recording this, you know, the sky is falling, inflation is booming, gas is up, crypto's down. More people are probably going to start doing their own thing. Um, what are some common mistakes they can avoid as they're ramping up maybe this side hustle? Okay. So if we're talking about somebody side hustle, who's coming into this ground zero, correct? Yeah. yeah, Or maybe, maybe they do have something small. Maybe they've been making 50 grand a year on the side and it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to make it on my own now. Right. There's too much uncertainty. I'm going to, I'm going to get laid off or maybe they, maybe they got laid off. Uh, cause layoffs are coming real estate. There's layoffs, <laughs> big layoffs already, you know, Carvana yeah. crash, all these cryptos are crashing. So then, and they're like, all right, I'm gonna try to go it on my own or, or ramp up this side project. So maybe they have a little bit of income, um, so far. Yeah. So my advice to that person is, you know, I'm not necessarily like, I don't need to be a CFO for somebody who is starting a side hustle or at about 50,000, but the advice right. I would give them. But, but even the people you, you, you're helping them at a million, but if, yeah. as you track back, go, Oh man, right. Six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, you did, you did what? Oh, that has a ripple effect all the way to today. I wish you didn't do that two years ago. Mm. See, what I'm, see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. So some of the, the biggest things is, you know, credit card debt, you know, running your company off of credit cards, you know, to be really smart about how much you're leveraging 18 to 20% credit cards to keep your cash flow going every month to really, instead of looking at, you know, what is or isn't working um, in the particular offerings, uh, the sales processes, et cetera. Um, because the, I think the biggest thing that happens up until that mark of about a million, like you were saying, when people get going, they're leveraging everything they have in the hopes that there will be a significant return down the road. So in the context of this time that we're in, and I couldn't agree with you more, uh, you know, we've been in a recession for a while and uh, we're quickly moving into a depression, in my humble opinion. Um, so for me, it's about staying lean, no matter where you're at. And when you are spending the money, um, try to you know pay for it instead of borrowing the money, whether it's a credit card or a line of credit or whatever, and really look at what is the anticipated ROI on that particular expense. Meaning if you're going to join a mastermind because you think it's going to um, help you to grow your business, okay, what are some metrics we can put around that? Okay, I'm going to spend $5,000 on this three-month mastermind, for example, and from my understanding of going through the process of purchasing this, I'm looking at being able to triple my business in 12 months. Um, and so if, if you have the numbers and the metrics around that, then it's a good decision. If you're just throwing money at the wall like spaghetti and hoping it'll stick and, you know, hoping on a wing and a prayer, that is not where you want to be right now. Every single dollar has to be treated as if, um, you know, you're putting it 
uh, into growth, into sustainability. So okay, some look. of the things to really look at are, you know, what are your gross sales? What does it cost you uh, to generate those sales and what's left over? And to do this, I don't care if you're doing $50,000 a year or you're doing, you know, $50 million a year. What are those numbers? And you should be knowing them every single month and um, know what your leftover is. Being able to put aside money for your tax bill. That's one of the, the other biggest things that people get into is, uh, you know, they get indebted to the IRS and their business suffers incredibly because they don't have the cash flow to, uh, you know, invest in new things and, and develop new products and et cetera, et cetera. So at this time, in summary, that's, that's what I, I it's, it's time to roll up our sleeves and stop being frivolous Americans that we are. You probably have some non-Americans uh, listening to this podcast. And it's time to really respect money and the power of money and making sure that we're putting every dollar where it counts. Not from a place of scarcity mindset, but from a place of just, you know what? These are the times we're in. And this dollar at some point in the next six to 12 months needs to at least double or triple for me with how I'm choosing to use it. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned masterminds. Like I'm I'm so torn, right? I, I know they're, they're good ones. Uh, there's just so many bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> I see people, the dirty little secret that I've learned is a lot, a lot of the gurus that you see, it was a pay to play people, people spent 25 grand to join some elite thing. And then they all promote one another and they, they kind of grow. Um, yeah. But a lot of them, people join, they just get milked because these guys know, they just recognize, Oh, this is, Oh, that gen. Yeah. Yeah. She's a lifetime learner. Let's get right. her. And people, they joined the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Uh, years ago, I, I had I was helping a friend of mine. She was in the one of the software communities I was in, and and I had like a little ninety day program, just one on one. And she was struggling in that, but then I hear that she's in like some twenty thousand dollar mastermind. And I heard through a mutual friend of ours, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then later she admitted, yeah, my husband said I can't spend any more money till I make money in my business. And I've, I've seen that so many times, you know, see people go from conference to conference. You know, I'll, one time, it was a few years ago when I was speaking more, and I, I, I was at like four conferences in like two months, you know, 10 weeks. And I would see all the same people at the same conferences, but I was, I was either paid to speak or at a minimum, you know, I got a free ticket and, and travel and you know, expenses were covered. And, you know, I did the math, like for those four events, people were spending upwards of 15 to 20 grand when you throw in tickets and lodging, you know, you're in San Diego, it's $400 a night for a hotel. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, what are y'all doing? Did you apply even what you learned in the first conference? Like, no, they just, you know, they'd be better off one on one. Let me let me bring a CFO in for 90 days or to do an audit, you know, to give me a, a health checkup where I am. Let me bring a sales guy in for 30 days and and flip over everything and you know, like selective. Exactly. You know, let me bring an operations, a Six Sigma lean, lean processing guy come in for 90 days. But they they think there's this, oh, well, my buddy, he's in Cancun at a mastermind. That, that's the real secret to success. Oh, my gosh. There, it's true. There is, it's an addiction to thinking that the solution and the answer lies within, hey, if I just hang out with these people, they have the answers, you know, somehow it's going to trickle into my subconscious and I'm going to wake up a millionaire tomorrow. And now granted, there is something about hanging out with people uh, who are where you want to be in terms of mindset, but let's really balance that with where you're at in your business and what's truly needed boots on the ground. What is going to move the needle going to Cancun to a mastermind is probably not going to go, um, moving your needle a whole, a whole lot. So it's, 
it's like you said, you know, okay, we have an extra 5,000. What's the best place that we can use that this month? Um, exactly what you were saying. Boots on the ground, practical. Entrepreneurs can get swept away in the romance um, of business and people will sell you uh, whatever you want to believe. And uh, so part of that really is also the maturation of the entrepreneur themselves. And, uh, you know, entrepreneurs go through different stages where um, they can be, you know, not in their sovereign energy and more like a child. And it's like, tell me what to do. And here's my credit card. And and the the journey of the entrepreneur goes through so many up levels on the inside you know world and the outside world and being able to become emotionally intelligent and being able to make emotionally sound decisions um that are really always looking at the vision the mission of the company um as well as what why are you doing this beyond your mission you know who who are the mouths that you're feeding uh, who are, you know, the bills that you're paying for? Let's say you have a parent in a nursing home or something like that. And I find that people get derailed into these delusions in terms of masterminds and to just have somebody with round table wisdom who is at the executive level, like whether it's myself or an executive in operations or uh, an executive in marketing. And who's been there and done that to help you to not waste a bunch of time and money and actually give you what you need, the practical, tangible stuff. And sometimes sort of the smack upside the head to um, let's get this party going already and let's start making more money and more profitability so that you can you can do what you want to do in the world um, and take care of your family in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And it's. That smack, I think, is true because like bringing you in one on one, I can't hide. Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm in Cancun, I can kind of gloss over things. Everybody, you don't really know me. I'm one of 10 or 20 or 30. We're drinking in between events and my hot seat's only an hour out of three days. So really, I don't have to be that raw. Uh, now granted some, you know, you're in a good mastermind. I, I can break somebody down fast, <laughs> you know, so I can, I can detect the bullshit and, and dig in, but still it's one hour of a, of a hot seat versus 30, 60, 90 days pouring through the books, then getting on some type of retainer for maintenance. Yes. You know, it'd probably be less money than a mastermind. You don't have to travel. I can do all this remote mm -hmm. um, and we can build on the success. Right. So okay. do people come to you? You know, is it is it because they're basically having a heart attack in their business? Like I got to do something different. Or are they coming to you? They're just getting savvy. And, you know, before the they're taking on water and are about to mm -hmm. sink you know, they come to you. So, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I have two types of clients that come into my world. The first ones, bless their heart. Uh, you know, they've at least been, been doing a million. They're usually between one to three million. And um, they haven't been taking care of their bookkeeping. They're years behind on their taxes. Uh, they get a letter from the IRS saying, you know, we're going to uh, seize your property or your bank accounts if you don't, you know, get your tax returns up to date, uh, if you don't get your taxes paid, et cetera. So I have those emergency type clients who they haven't been paying attention to anything. It's just been robbing Peter to pay Paul every month, uh, you know, relying on credit cards or lines of credit or, you know, some of these other things that they have out there these days. Um, so typically it's an emergency. And so it's like, okay, it's time to grow up, have some come to Jesus and, uh, off we go and we get their systems cleaned up, optimized. We get their, their bookkeeping done on a monthly basis. We get their tax returns filed for them. We set up payment plans for them. And then from there is usually where the, the second type of client comes in. They have all that stuff figured out. They've been, you know, getting their bookkeeping well done. They've been paying their taxes. 
they are the this particular second type of client they are hungry to scale and grow and they have a proof of concept and it's go time but they're not sure how to do that they may have hired you know a really great marketing director but they realize that the person who's been left out of their growth up until now is an executive financial perspective um, to really be able to have the roundtable conversations that need to have to go from one to three to seven to 10 and then continue on. So that's the, the second type of client. Generally, they are wanting to know how we can help them get at their metrics, what metrics are important to them, because they're not even sure what, what really they need. They've just heard through the grapevine that I need metrics and KPIs. Um, so my team, you know, depending on who they are, where they are, and what they're doing, um, you know, we set up automated metric dashboards for them that actually work um, and really drill into like, what are the top five numbers for every department? Um, and so helping them to understand that, um, you know, I teach a lot of multiple millionaires how to read financial statements because they don't know. So that's another piece of it is really executive coaching. As that person sitting in that CEO seat, it's usually the founder, um, they're not even sure how to read a profit and loss statement. And so there's coaching usually um, in that arena as well, because if they can't read a P&L, it makes it very difficult for them to lead um, the, the overall vision and implementation um, and direct their other uh, managing uh, team members. So those are some of the things cash runway, you know, they finally start want to start looking at forecasting, budgeting, um, more planning. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, the second type of client that comes into my world. Yeah, cool. So I'm sure we have both of those listening. <laughs> what do you what do you want them to do? Where should they go? You mentioned your website, uh, Jen Bro, and it's J E N B R O dot com, right? Right. Or you can email me at Jen at Jenbro dot com. Uh, everything I do is through referral and networking only. I have the best clients. I fall in love with them. We have so much fun, and their world expands uh, what they thought was possible. And um, it's 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 such a blessing to be able to help people who are doing amazing things out in the world um, to really expand that and step into more profitability and confidence. Uh, you know, one thing I give them is confidence in all things, numbers and money. And um, I think that that's such an important part of the entrepreneur journey, no matter where you're at. So, yep, you can, like I said, you can email me, Jen at and uh, we can have a conversation from there and, uh, most of my engagements are pretty custom, but at the same time, you know, there's a basic menu of services, if you would. Yeah. And you got to look at things. It's like ignoring the, the issues you know that you have doesn't make them any better. <laughs> no. And it's what's stalling the company growth. And yeah. it's what's causing you to stay up at night and worry and yeah. fret. And it's what's causing the bank account to continue to either, you know, flatline or, uh, you know, go on the red. And people don't realize that until they start working with me. That's like, you know, the, the quote I use is the most difficult and uncomfortable conversations that you, you grow the capacity to learn to have mm -hmm. is directly related to how successful you are or aren't going to be. Yep. When we can have those hard conversations, those very difficult, very uncomfortable ones, whether it's with ourselves, a team member, um, a business partner, uh, a client, the, the more we grow that capacity inside of us, uh, the greater success that we can step into. Mm -hmm. Amen. Very nice. Jenbro.com, your CFO. In a bottle, bringing the magic all the way from Florida. Well, thanks for sharing your wisdom. It's been great. Thank you so much, Wes. Appreciate it. All right. You have a great care. day. Me too. Do you know how to read a P&L? 
It's hard to lead if you don't know where the money is coming from and going. Amen. Look, just ignoring things, it's not going to make them any better. All right, we've got a crazy world. We've got inflation. We've got crypto crashing, but I think it'll rebound. We've got software as a service, tech stocks crashing, realtors or uh, home builders. Those stocks are crashing. Heck, HubSpot, I followed them for years. I owned them for a while, made some good money, got out Got out early. But, you know, they went from 866 a share to under 300. They're hovering around that right now. Let me see here. Let me see. HubSpot, 307.88 today. So, I mean, it's just crazy. Ethereum's at 1151. Bitcoin's just over 20,000. Um. But there's some opportunities there. And if, you, if you're paying attention to your money, you'll know how to leverage it to seize these opportunities. You know, the old adage, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets. But the other part of that is even if the blood is yours. So you may have taken some licks from the government shutdown 2020, spread into 2021. Hell, these jackasses in California are still extending it 2022. Um, but hey... It is what it is. You know, you can you can moan and complain, chase windmills, or you can say, all right, this is how it is. How do I make money in this new normal? And then get after it, okay? But you got to know where your money's going. And if you need to make more, invest in yourself. Invest in yourself every single time. Every single bad investment that I've been handed over the years was when I trusted someone else. I placed it too much trust in something I didn't understand, thinking somebody was smarter, wiser, better than me, and it bit me in the ass. Invest in yourself. Okay, I'm, I'm booking a trip to Austin in October right now, uh, and it feels good. Uh, going back with some people that I've known for over 20 years, and, you know, I'm investing in myself. Uh, that and some other thing, what new software yesterday uh, i actually had a guy on the crm sushi podcast today i'm gonna be cleaning that up and publishing that here shortly uh, founder of some new technology i'm gonna start using uh you know learning new things you know investing in myself always has paid off so do the same all right uh, do some one-on-one with me uh, go to the website the saleswhisper.com hit the contact us and we'll talk um or join this in the program, sellmoreofeverything.com. All right, it's the most affordable way to get ongoing help for a year. Um, come join us. All right, that's all I'm going to say. Now go sell something.